Whenever we believe this is just to us and it doesn't happen, it leads us to the conclusion that either God does not exist or God is not really good. That's the danger we have when we start reading ourselves into a promise. We start to wrongly believe that God is some kind of cosmic Coke machine. We come up to our God, we put our money in, we do what we're supposed to do, we push the button. Then he must deliver on exactly what we want. Well, essentially, we're reducing God to our butler, who exists, to serve us. This week on Connecting the Gap, we're going to talk about a very much misunderstood and misinterpreted scripture in the Bible that's used out of context quite often, Jeremiah 29, 11. We're going to get back into that right after this. In this world, there are many disconnects that cause chaos in our lives. Connecting the Gap podcast is birthed from the desire to share hope and restoration of the power of the gospel by being transparent and open in our biblical walk with God. Let's take a few moments this week as we navigate God's Word and encourage each other to connect the gap. Welcome to Connecting the Gap podcast. I'm Daniel Moore. You can visit my website at connectingthegap.net for all the podcasting platforms that we are on, as well as any information you would like to find out about the ministry. We're also available on YouTube, Rumble, the podcasting app Edify, and you can also stream us on your Alexa or Google smart devices as well, such as the Echo Dot or the Google Home Hub. If you're in social media, you can also reach us on social media at Facebook and X, formerly known as Twitter, at CTGAP online. Well, this week we are going to put together a little episode on a scripture. Uh, About a few weeks ago here, I was on Facebook, and one of my podcasting buddies that I have, he goes to church with me, he runs the podcast Something to Not On. He was making posts on Facebook about Jeremiah, and it was very interesting. If you'd like to go check that out, you can look him up on Facebook at Something to Not On and check out that post. He was talking about how Jeremiah, through all the years that he uh, ministered and prophesied to Israel, he never had a convert. And you would think, you know, that someone out there preaching the gospel and someone out there doing what God's called them to do, that they would at least see some fruits from their labor. But he made some good points there in that Facebook post about what it means to be a Christian sometimes and not seem to have any results in what you're doing. But yet Jeremiah stuck to the task and he continued to minister and prophesy to Israel, trying to get them to turn back to God. And another podcasting buddy of mine made a comment on that. That post, and then I also made a comment about this scripture, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. As I basically said that this scripture is one of the most popular, most used out of context scriptures in the Bible, and it comes from Jeremiah. So I guess Jeremiah gets the reward for having that scripture in it as well. And of course, a response to that. Uh, Nate Vinio, the host of that podcast, he came back and said, well, I think somebody needs to do a podcast on that. And he had a little wink emoji on there. So I I got the hint. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I was going to start my new series this week, but I'm going to take another week here to continue working on that and praying about that. And I do want to mention my new series. It's going to be starting next week here on Connecting the Gap. And basically, this uh, series that I have coming up is going to have multiple parts. We're going to talk about who is Jesus. You know, a lot of times when we have Jesus in our life and we look to Him to supply our needs and you look to Him for our salvation, we look to Him for healer, uh, there's just a lot of reasons that we look to Jesus, but there are moments in our life when things aren't going quite the way that we think that they should, especially, uh, for instance, if you're seeking a healing in your life. We can be so wrapped up in trying to pray to, to, to God and to Jesus to give us the healing for that situation that we have going on in our life, that we have a tendency to forget that Jesus is really more than a healer. He's other things in our life as well. And so each week, we're going to take a episode and go through the different attributes of Jesus as a healer, as our Savior, that He is good, He is love. And we're going to uh, do some extensive Bible study. We're going to kind of flip the switch a little bit and go more into Bible study mode. So it's probably something you might want to have some paper and pen close by to make some notes, maybe go back and listen to the episodes again. There's going to be lots of Scripture packed into it and a lot of truth that will be brought out of those Scriptures. 
I'm looking forward to that. That's going to start next week. If you know anybody that might uh, benefit from that type of a study or could possibly change their life, please share that out. I'm going to be putting some things on Facebook here, uh, continue to put some things on there, kind of uh, putting out there what the podcast is and that it's coming up, just some advertising, I guess you could say. And you can share those out on your social media as well. Just help me get the word out that uh, whoever need to hear these episodes would hear them and that they would come to know Jesus in a more real way. That's what this podcast is all about. It's not about making money or uh, putting myself on a pedestal or any of that. I study the Bible with you guys every week. I learn stuff all the time, and it's just uh, my joy to be able to sit here and do what God's called me to do. And I just pray that you guys would just join me in prayer that the right people would hear these episodes. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started into this week's, though, as we are going to be going through Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. This week, I want to open up with a story about one of the most popular verses anywhere. Chances are, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you might know this verse. You've probably actually quoted this verse. You've seen this verse somewhere, and I'm going to tell you a story that will introduce this very popular verse. Years ago, there was a pastor, and before he was a follower of Jesus, he partied. Probably like a lot of you out there listening did, I had my time of partying that I went through as well. He got really rip-roaring drunk one night in college, came back to his fraternity room, and he got into his bed. Well, it was one of those nights when the bed was spinning. He had learned that whenever the bed is spinning when you're drunk, you're supposed to put your foot on the ground, and that settles your stomach and your head. Well, he put his foot on the ground, and that didn't stop it. So he thought, well, I'll put my whole body on the ground. So he got down on the ground, and it's still spinning. He wanted to listen to some music. So you know what you do in the 80s when you listen to music? Well, you turn on your boombox. That's what you do. He reached up. He turned on his boombox. The station wasn't exactly on a station. You know how it's sometimes in between stations. There's a bunch of static and noise when you're trying to find the channel. So he's sitting there fiddling with it, trying to get the tuner right. Well, evidently, he accidentally landed on a Christian station. And little did he know that the voice on the other side would say something that would really impact his life. There was this most angelic, soothing female voice. It was like an angel's voice that said something along the lines like this. I don't know who you are right now, but if you're hurting, God cares for you. He's laying there spinning on the floor. He's like, that's me. That's me. She's talking to me. That's got to be me. There might have been other people saying, that's me. I'm hurting right now. Well, she's like, I just want you to know that there's a verse that really could impact your life. Then the angelic voice read this verse to the drunk guy trying to get the room to stop spinning. She read Jeremiah 29, 11, the verse we're going to look at this week, which says, For I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then she read the next part that talks about if you seek God, you will find him. He remembered just sitting there in that drunk state, wondering to himself, could that be true? Was this verse really for me? Does God really care about me? Does he have plans for me? Does he have plans to bless me, to prosper me? That verse impacted him in a massively significant way. Odds are decent that some of you have a story probably about that verse. Maybe you've got it on a coffee mug, and you drink out of it every day, and you love that coffee mug. Chances are some of you got a graduation card with that verse on it. It's the most popular verse on graduation cards. Chances are good some of you probably have a refrigerator magnet with that verse on it. I would dare to say there's probably somebody listening who has a pillow that your grandma cross-stitched that verse onto that pillow because there's no better verse for Nana's all over the world to cross-stitch onto pillows. Well, it's such an amazing and popular and comforting and soothing and hope-filled verse. Well, what I want to do today, though, is show you that there's actually maybe a little bit more to that verse than a lot of us understand, and I want to help bring some context to it, to reframe it a bit, and then perhaps you might even love this verse even more after we've completed dissecting Jeremiah 29, 11. What are we going to do in order to get a little deeper understanding into this verse? Well, if you've been listening to my podcast for a while, if you remember back to episode 130 and 134, we talked about three things that we do in order to better understand the Bible as we dissected John 13, 13 through 14 and Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. The first thing, if you'll remember, is we try to understand the context. What is the context? We want to know who wrote this verse, to whom was it written, 
What was the broader picture? What was going on? What came before this verse? What came after this verse? We want to understand the verse in context of the reason that it was written. The second thing we want to do, we want to interpret Scripture with Scripture. The best commentary on the Bible, believe it or not, is actually the Bible. When we look at a verse, we want to see what else did the Bible say about this theme or this big idea. We're going to interpret Scripture with Scripture. Context. Interpret the Bible with the Bible. And then number three, we want to apply it. I said it before that the Bible is not just a text to be studied. The Bible is actually letters to us to be lived out. It's God's living word that transforms our life. We're not just students of the word, but we apply it and we live in it every day in our life. Well, Jeremiah 29, 11 starts out, God has plans to prosper you. Well, let's look at that verse in context and see if we can get a broader understanding. Verse 1 of Jeremiah 29 actually gives us the context. Let's see if you can pick it up. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent. So question number one, who wrote this letter? The answer is Jeremiah. It's right there. It's the prophet Jeremiah sent it from Jerusalem. Now, who did he write this to? Well, he wrote it to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Well, what's going on? Well, Jeremiah is writing this letter to the Jewish exiles, the people who were taken out of their homeland into captivity under King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. They say, well, why were they in exile? Well, the reason is because they blatantly rebelled against God. They disobeyed God and turned to false gods and turned to other idols. God says, basically, because of your ill behavior, because of your sinfulness, for the next 70 years, you're going to be under the control of the Babylonians. You are in exile. Well, when we read this verse, what we need to understand is there will be specific promises in the Bible, and there's going to be general promises. There are specific promises made to a specific group of people. There are also general promises that are made to everybody. The truth is that Jeremiah 29, 11 is a specific promise made to the Jewish exiles. We need to understand this promise is not specifically to us, but specifically to a nation. The problem is for me, when I read that verse, God has plans to prosper you. I always thought you meant me. And why is that? Well, because I want to be the main character of everything that happens in the Bible. I want all of it to be all about me. And that's the problem. What we want to do is we want to do proper exegesis, not eisegesis, and it's not Jesus like J-E-S-U-S. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? It's actually G-E-S-I-S, not the same Jesus. Exegesis means ex, E-X. It means to pull out of. Our goal is to pull truth out of the text. Eisegesis is a word that means to see in the text what we want to see or to read ourselves into the text. If you do eisegesis, it doesn't mean you don't love Jesus. It doesn't mean that you're a heretic. It doesn't mean you're going to go to hell where the worm never dies and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. What it means is you simply do what all of us do at some point, is you're reading through your own filter and you're seeing yourself in the text. The reason why this is dangerous and why we want to try to avoid doing it because we all do it at some point, is that if we start to believe Jeremiah 29, 11 as a specific promise to us that God is going to prosper us, that God's going to bless us, that no harm will ever come to us, whenever one of those things does not happen, you're going, well, I prayed and now I'm not blessed. I'm faithful and guess what? I lost my job. I'm serving God and my kid is extremely sick. Well, whenever we believe this is just to us and it doesn't happen, it leads us to the conclusion that either God does not exist or that God is not really good. That's the danger we have when we start reading ourselves into a promise. We start to wrongly believe that God is some kind of cosmic Coke machine. We come up to God, we put our money in, we do what we're supposed to do, and we push the button. Then he must deliver on exactly what we want. Essentially, we're reducing God to our butler who exists to serve us. Like he's standing there saying, may I serve you? May I serve you? 
Well, the bottom line is, we exist to serve God and glorify God. His highest calling and purpose is not to serve us. He served us through Jesus. He blesses us in so many ways, but ultimately, God is not saying, what can I do for you? I exist for your pleasure. We exist to bring Him glory, and that's why we have to be very careful not to read ourselves into a promise that was really not made for us. And you're probably like, wow, (laughs) I'm really glad I listened to this episode today. Now I got to throw away my coffee mug. I can't wear my favorite shirt anymore. I got to scrub over my Jeremiah 2911 tattoo. I got to take a knife and cut up Nana's pillow that she crossed this for me. Great. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Well, no, let's, let's not get there too fast. Let's dive into it some more. And I think you may actually find that there's power and truth all over this verse. Another question. We're looking at Jeremiah 29. What comes before Jeremiah 29? Well, the answer is Jeremiah 28. You know, we're getting this down. We're figuring it out. If you read in Jeremiah 28, and I hope that you will, I'll give you a quick summary. There is a guy in there named Hananiah. Hananiah comes in and says, guess what? This is only going to last for two years. You thought you were going to be in exile for all this time, but God's going to break the Babylonians. And in two years, you are out of here. Well, if you read Jeremiah 28, there's this showdown that goes on between Hananiah and the prophet Jeremiah, where Hananiah takes off the yoke of the prophet Jeremiah and breaks it. All of a sudden, Jeremiah is like, oh, wait, wait, wait. What you're saying, Hananiah, that sounds really good, but it is not true. What Hananiah was, was a false prophet, and he was delivering what I call false good news, or in today's terms, fake news. False good news, this is only going to last for two years. Jeremiah the prophet says, no, 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 you're wrong, and you're going to die. It's pretty serious. Don't get this wrong, because it'll cost you. In the seventh month of that year, guess what happened? The false prophet Hananiah died. Wow, that's better than an HBO miniseries. You ought to read your Bible. I mean, this is good stuff. This is precisely why parents all over the world named their children Jeremiah, and there isn't nobody named Hananiah because he was a false prophet with false good news. Today, it's so easy to pursue this false good news or this fake news. I want what feels good. I want easy believism. I want God to do everything I want him to do. I want it to be done all about me. Without knowing, we can slip into eisegesis where the text is always about me or God is always here to serve me and everything's going to be about me. If we're not careful, we'll be drawn to a type of teaching that almost always says that kind of thing. I really try to be careful not to talk bad about other teaching styles and such, but if you watch on television, especially towards the beginning of the year, you'll hear a lot of messages like this. This is the year of abundance. This is the year of the breakthrough. This is the year of victory. Today on this day, you will prosper. This seed will bring a harvest, and on and on and on and on. A lot of times, they'll have extra syllables when they say words too, like, like, gotta, <laughs> gotta, it's going to be with you today, whatever. Anyway, that's just, I, I probably shouldn't be making fun of it, but that's really the way it is. I sincerely hope that for every one of you, this is the year of your breakthrough. I sincerely hope that this is the year of prosperity for you. I sincerely hope that on this day, whatever you need is going to happen. The problem is, if we only seek that and we only believe that, Then one day when that doesn't happen, we end up thinking, well, God is not real or God is not good. Before long, we reduce Christianity to a means to an end. God exists to make my life easier. God exists to make me comfortable. God exists to make me prosperous. God exists to bless me. When we're not careful, we become the main object of God's word when the reality is God is the main object of everything. He is the source of all. He is the answer to all things. He is the object of our greatest desire. He is the prize. What we want is not the prize. He is the prize. If we're not careful, we will settle for, search after, long for, and hunger for false good news. If I teach Jeremiah 29 11, I want to teach it in such a way that it will teach consistently anywhere in the world. If it's all about you getting a new house, a new car, better life, or never being sick, Well, try teaching that to the Christian mom in Syria who just lost a kid to kidnapping and now lives in a refugee tent. 
God will never let anything bad happen to you. Tell that to the Christian parents who just lost a child to malaria, and that sickness could have been prevented by a very inexpensive mosquito net that they did not have access to. Here's the thing for me. As a Bible teacher, I want to make sure that I can teach this anywhere. Let me just put it this way, and here's a a sarcasm warning. I'm about to be sarcastic. I'm giving you fair warning. I'm letting you know that it's coming. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just drop it on you. You just never know what's coming. But I'm letting you know, here's a sarcasm warning. Jeremiah 29, 11, this verse actually applies to Western Christians only. You know, God bless the USA. God bless the USA. This is for the United States Christians. This is our verse. Well, in other words... The rest of you in church all over the world, God loves you and everything, but you're screwed when it comes to this because God blesses the USA. In the USA, we serve a God who always gets us the best parking spots at the mall, and we serve a God who gets us our dream home, and we serve a God who enables us to have an upgraded iPhone every time it comes out. Praise the Lord Jesus. That's the God I serve. And some of you are probably afraid to laugh, like, is that really funny? Is God going to strike him dead? Is that true? God does bless the USA, right? Okay, sarcasm is over. It's a very self-centered view. My thought is this. If I can't teach this anywhere, I shouldn't teach it anywhere. Let me say that again. If I can't teach this in a way in a country where the average wage is 2 to $3 a day, then I don't want to teach it in that way at all. If I can't teach it the very same way in an inner city to a youth program to the wealthiest people in the suburbs, if I can't teach it with integrity in all environments, then I don't want to teach it anywhere. If it's not true everywhere, it's not true anywhere. What I want to do is teach it in such a way that applies to everybody so that we'll all have integrity. We're going to take a break here for a moment. We're talking about Jeremiah 29 11 today on Connecting the Gap podcast. We're going to get back into completely dissecting this verse and pulling some truths out of that verse. We're going to be back right after this. Hi, I'm John Sorensen, president of Evangelism Explosion International, and you're listening to Share Life Today. Have you ever been unsure on how to start sharing the gospel? Maybe you're ready to talk about spiritual things with the people in your life, but you're just not sure how to bring it up. Well, today I'd like to share with you some springboards that can help you start a spiritual conversation. One of the best ways to begin is by telling our friends how having a relationship with Christ has changed us for the better. We call these God stories. And the more we walk with Christ, the more of these stories we have to share. Start by telling them something that you've seen God do in your life, like a change that he's brought about, an answered prayer, or even a restored relationship. End your God story with a confident statement that you have concerning heaven and eternal life. And this will open the door to sharing more. For tips and tools on how you can start a gospel conversation, visit our website at sharelife.today. That's sharelife.today. Welcome back to this week's episode of Connecting the Gap Podcast. We're talking about Jeremiah 29, 11 this week. During the break there, I got my sip of coffee, and I'm ready to go and finish up this discussion for today. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this one and taking some notes and, and as, as we together come to a complete understanding of what Jeremiah chapter 29, 11 actually means. As I continue here, for simply pursuing a God that gives us joy without pain, blessings without trial, Prosperity without any bumps in the road, we're actually pursuing false good news. And that's a very dangerous place to be. And that's why a lot of people walk away from the faith. Well, God didn't do what I wanted to do. Well, I tithe and I didn't get rich. Well, I went to church and my kid got sick. This is a specific promise to a specific group of people. Let me give you a general promise. You think it's been depressing so far? You know, you're thinking, well, I came to listen to Connecting the Gap to get built up today. Why did I come here today? This is some hard stuff. Well, you think it's been hard so far, we haven't even got started yet. I'm about to give you two really, really good verses to put on your coffee mug. These are for you. 2 Timothy 3.12 says this, if you're a Christian. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be what? They will be persecuted. 
you know, put that on a magnet and put that on your refrigerator so you can look at it every day. You're like, oh, praise God, I'm going to be persecuted today. I love this verse. It's my memory verse. It's my life verse. It's my life's verse. I love that verse. Well, here's another one. Philippians 129. For it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to what? To suffer for him. Here we go again. Oh, glory to God. I love that t-shirt. Every time I wear it to the Bible study, they love that one on my t-shirt. Well, here's the deal. Here's what we have to understand. The good news, the real good news, the good news is not that God saves us from our trials. The good news is that God saves us from our sins. That is the real good news. The reason you gave me a polite golf clap probably for that, and, and I thank you for that, and you didn't stand up and go crazy, is because we often don't understand just how good of news that is. Scripture teaches us that we all fall horribly short. Here's the problem. When it comes to God's standards, His standard is holiness. His standard is perfection, and we fall short. This is what most of us think. We don't fall short like this. We, 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 we fall short like, I am filthy rags. I am completely unrighteous. There is nothing good inside of me. I serve a God who did for me when I could never earn and didn't deserve. He became one of us in the person of Jesus, who loved the most unlovable, reached out to those that religion rejected, accepted people as they were, but never left them as he found them. On the cross, he became sin for me, so much so that God had to look away. He looks up to heaven and says, I did what you sent me to do. It is finished. This is the good news. This is the best news. This represents a good God. This is the good news, not that God exists to save us from our trials, but that God sent Jesus to save us from our sins. We serve a God that is better than just saving us from our trials. We serve a God who uses our trials to conform us to the image of Christ. We serve a God who is not just in it for our temporary well-being, but God is shaping us for His eternal glory. Therefore, when God does not do exactly what we want Him to do, we don't panic and run away from our God. We embrace Him for His character and for His nature. He is a good God. The gospel is that Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. The one who knew no sin became sin for us. He died in our place that we could live. Because of that, our only reasonable response is to take up our cross, deny ourselves because it's not about us, and to follow Him. Our highest calling and purpose is to lay down our lives to serve Him. That is what we're created to do. It doesn't feel good, and it's not popular. You know, isn't it more fun when it's all about us? It's right when it's all about Him. He sent His Son for us that we could know Him, that we could serve Him, and that we could follow Him. You know, the exiles, they wanted it easy just like we do. You know, I want it easy. Two years, please. Get us out of here. We're in bondage, and we don't want to be in bondage. Well, right before that famous verse in Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, and what verse is that? Well, the answer is Jeremiah twenty nine ten. In verse 10, it says this. This is what the Lord says. When how many years are completed? When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come back to you and fulfill my good promise and bring you back to this place. 70 years. Who was Jeremiah speaking to? Do you remember? He was speaking to the elders. How old do you think the elders were? <laughs> well, the answer is they were very elderly. He's speaking to elderly people. And imagine saying to a 70-year-old, in 70 years, I will come back. I know the plans I have for you, plans to bless you, prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in the future. And they're going, well, we're not going to see this happen. We're not going to see this happen in the natural. Well, God knew that they would see it happen in the supernatural because he had plans to bless them and prosper them, to give them the hope in a future that wasn't just based on this life. Why? Because no eye has seen and no ear has heard all the good things that God has planned for those who love Him eternally. You know, I want it now. I want it now. I want to be prosperous. I want a car with butt warmers. That's all I want. God butt warmers because it gets cold here. It's your fault because you made it cold. Well, in 2911, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Well, the next time someone quotes this out of context, the next time they're wearing a shirt 
the next time you see it on their coffee mug, the next time someone says, oh, this verse changed my life, will whip out your sermon notes and say, hey, that's out of context. You're a heretic and you're going to hell. That's what you do. (laughs) No, no, no. I forbid you to do that. Do not be that person. Don't ever be that person. Just because this text is not to us doesn't mean that there's not truth in this text. This text is true. One, for the plans I have for you, okay, does God have plans for us? Does God have a purpose for us? Of course, all day long he does. Ephesians 1.11 says God works everything in conformity with a purpose of his will. God works in all things to bring about good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So yes, God has a purpose and a plan. Does God have plans to bless people? All day long. The Bible says that we interpret scripture with scripture. God is a good God and loves to give good gifts to his children. Does God prosper people? All the time. God actually gives wealth. Wealth is not a bad thing. With wealth, you can do a lot of good things. God gives wealth. God prospers a lot of people. He doesn't prosper everybody. In fact, prospering doesn't just mean financial prospering. Sometimes prospering and blessing means relationships, which is actually better than money when you think about it. It means sometimes health. It means sometimes that we just have intimacy with other people. Sometimes it means we just know we're right with God. Whenever you get cancer, can you still have a hope? All day long. We have hope that God uses doctors. We have hope that the name of Jesus is bigger than the name of cancer. We have a hope in God who says, all things are possible with me, and you still have hope. Whenever your life falls apart, you think, well, I could never overcome this. Well, can God ever use me again? After what I did, can God ever use me? Yes, you have a future. We serve a God who works in all things to bring about good. He will use it for your future. He will take you where you messed up, do something in you, help conform you to the image of his son, Jesus. You're not finished yet. If you're not dead, you're not done. God still has something for you. This verse, though, is not specifically for us, although there is truth in it. Embrace it, but don't stop in verse 11. Do not stop there because the verse that really could go on your coffee mug is the one that comes after that. And that is verse 12, 13, and 14, which does become a general promise for all of us today. And why? Because this is consistent with other promises all throughout Scripture, and that is this. God says, when you call on me and come to me and pray to me, I will do what? God says, I will listen to you. God says this. He says, you will seek me and find me when you do what? When you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you. God says, no matter what you're going through, I'm going to be there for you. Whenever you call on me, I will hear you. When you cry out to me, I am there. No matter what you do, I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you always. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will not fear. Why? Because you are with me, God. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You will never, ever leave me. You will never, ever leave me. The main point of this discussion is not that God delivers you from your trials. It's not that God always gives you exactly what you want. It's that God will never leave you or forsake you. He's more concerned with your eternity than with your now, and He is always and absolutely good through and through. Therefore, our faith does not rest on what He does or what He does not do. Because of what He has already done for us on the cross is enough to say that you are worthy of the rest of my life. Your character and your nature is good. Therefore, God, I choose to serve you, choose to follow you, choose to lay down my life for you. Years and years later, after that pastor's drunk spinning room moment with God and the angelic voice coming out of that 1980s oversized boombox telling him, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And that verse really ministered to him. It's important to him today. It's one of his favorite verses. Because even though it wasn't specifically meant for him, there is truth in it. And the next part of the text is what truly changed his life. If you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, says the Lord, and that's what he did. In the middle of his brokenness and his sin, without even knowing how to do it, he started calling on him. God, I need you. If you're there, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. 
And did he ever, because that's a general promise to every single one of us. When you call on him, he will hear your cry. When you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. When you seek him, you will find him when you seek him with all of your heart. As we close today's episode, I want to start with those of you who may be going through a really challenging time right now. Sometimes when you're in a hard time, you're praying for help and a miracle and it's not coming. Sometimes it can rattle people's faith. I want to take a moment and just pray for you. Some of you right now, you're facing maybe some financial challenges. Like, for example, close to where I live, there are many people losing jobs right now. Some big plants are closing in some towns close to me. It's really heartbreaking. God is your provider. He still loves you and he is faithful. Others of you right now, you might have bad medical news for you or somebody that you love. Some of you are battling depression possibly right now. Nothing's really wrong, but everything seems like it's wrong. Some of you, you've got relational challenges. You've got family chaos. Whatever it is you're going through, something right now, and you really need God's presence and you want to ask God for a miracle. If that's you today, I'll be very honored just to pray for you. Let's pray. God, I thank you today for those who are reaching out to you, and even with an extended hand or an extended heart. God, we just believe that's what we're doing as we're drawing near to you. We're calling on you. God, I thank you that many times you do deliver us from our trials. I thank you, God, that you hear our prayer and you do miracles. God, I thank you that your highest purpose isn't just to do that for us, but to deliver us and save us from our sins. Right now, we rejoice in this, God, and we ask that for those who are struggling and hurting today, that somehow by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would be enough right now, that you would guide our hearts and our minds and our souls in Christ Jesus, that you would give us a supernatural peace that goes beyond our human ability to understand. God, according to your word, you tell us that we can ask. We ask for miracles. God, we ask for healing. We ask for financial provision. We ask for forgiveness in relationships where there are woundings. God, we ask, would you help us to overcome temptation? We pray that you would break any bondage that holds us back. We believe, God, that you hear our prayer and that for many people, you will do all these things and even more, even now. We pray, God, we recognize that you respond to our faith. And sometimes, God, when you don't do what we ask you to do in the moment, it becomes challenging for us. We choose right now to focus on your character, your goodness, believing, God, you have a higher purpose, believing, God, that you'll use our trials to help us to be more intimate with you. God, we trust you. We believe you can. God, we believe you will. Even if you don't do what we ask, God, we still believe and we worship you. God, may we serve you well. May you be the center of our stories, God, reflecting your love, being faithful to you in all that we do as we seek you and worship you. Well, as we close this episode today, what do you do? You recognize this, that all of us have fallen short of God's standard of perfection. All of us have fallen way short. Well, why do you feel like you did something wrong sometimes? You may think, I feel guilty. Well, it's because there's a conscience inside of you and you recognize you did something wrong. We tend to think, well, I need to be good enough and try to become religious and try to be right and stop doing wrong things. Well, the reality is you cannot be good enough for God. It is impossible. That's why God in His mercy sent His Son who was without sin. The good news, the gospel, is not that He saved us from our trials, but that He saves us from our sin. When you call on Him, you become a brand new person. Not a better version of you, but a new you. The old is gone, the new has come. You're spiritually born anew, and there are many of you that the very reason why you're here listening today, and you know it, is time for a new birth. It's time to say, yes, Jesus, take my life. It's no longer about me. I surrender it completely to you. That's my prayer. I turn from my sins. I turn toward him. I give my life to him. I'm drawing near to him, believing he will draw near to me. Now I surrender my life to him. That's your prayer. Closing today, Heavenly Father, I give you my life, asking Jesus to save me, to be my Lord. I believe he died for me. He rose again so I can live for you. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you the rest of my life. My life is not my own. Today, I give it to you in Jesus' name, I pray. Well, if you prayed that prayer with me today, 
I hope that there is a newness inside of you that you can tell a difference, that God has put you on a new path and a new place forward. For those of us that maybe um, have had Christ in our life all along, maybe it's a renewing in our spirit. We all know that occasionally we need to get back to the throne, get back to Jesus' feet and ask him to renew the spirit within us, to have a fresh infilling of his Holy Spirit. Well, I'm out of here for today for this week. Next week, we start our new series, Who is Jesus? Looking forward to that. Please subscribe and share wherever you listen to this podcast at. I certainly do appreciate that and keep my ministry in your prayers. I'm out of here until next week. Don't forget that God's word never fails us. God's word has stood the test of time and through Jesus' death on the cross, he has connected the gap. You've been listening to Connecting the Gap podcast. I'm Daniel Moore, the host for this podcast, and I personally thank you for listening each week. In this world, there are many disconnects that cause chaos in our lives. This podcast is birthed from the desire to share hope and restoration of the power of the gospel by being transparent and open in our biblical walk with God. Each week, we take a few moments as we navigate God's Word and peer into other people's testimonies and encourage each other to connect the gap. We upload a new audio podcast every Thursday and a video version of it on YouTube and Rumble. We are also on the Christian podcasting app Edify. You can subscribe to our podcast on many of the available podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Spotify, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, and many more. We are also available on your Alexa-enabled devices. If you would like to give us feedback or would like to contact our ministry for any reason, including prayer, visit our contact page at www.connectingthegap.net and send us a message. We hope you are blessed by this ministry. This is a production of Connecting the Gap Ministries.